afternoon and welcome to our webinar on the COVID-19 infodemic, ensuring universal access to credible health information. From the very onset of the pandemic, accurate information has been key to response effectively. Understanding the virus, the pandemic, the disease, possible ways of preventing and treating it was and still is key. But there's a deluge of information. How do we filter out what we really need? At the same time, we also see information gaps. Important information is missing. There's also a lot of disinformation and we've also seen malicious disinformation. And this all together can lead to harmful behaviors. It may erode social cohesion, but it also may actually lead to ineffective responses to the COVID-19 crisis. Therefore, improving the management of this infodemic is critical for a su su successful pandemic response. My name is Matthias Wismar, and I'm program manager with the European Observatory in Health Systems and Policies. I'm your facilitator today, and I will guide you through the program and the session. Our keynote speaker today is Christine Janiak from the World Health Organization. And Christine is responsible for developing exactly management uh, strategies on the infodemic. She has been instrumental in devising policies, guidelines, toolboxes, and she will tell us about all these different elements and also the experiences working with countries. We've lined up for you also a number of spotlight speakers. First of all, Ashley Winter from the Cabinet Office in the UK. She will talk about strategic communication with regards to vaccine confidence, including preventative, proactive, and de uh, defensive approaches. But she will zoom in into a very concrete application of it, the inoculation game go viral. This is followed by Anna Lia Lohinva from the Institute of Health and Welfare in Finland. She will show us a very practical intervention research, which is real time and which is informing policymakers and stakeholders what actually do citizens know about the pandemic and what is their risk perception? How can we improve communication on the basis of this? And last but not least, we welcome Neville Kalecha from the Ministry of Health in Malta who will explain to us how to confront the infodemic with less than abundant resources in your hands. So the aims and objectives of this webinar is to understand what is exactly the infodemics, what are the tools to deal with it, and what are first-hand experiences from countries dealing with the infodemics. Just a couple of things on the housekeeping. Our time budget today is very tight, which is a challenge for all speakers. Um, please send us your questions and comments through the chat box. My colleague Erica will feed back the chat to us towards the end of the session. We are also going to record this video and planning to publish it later on our YouTube channel. Finally, we will send you an evaluation form and we would kindly ask you to fill it in as it is quite important for us to uh, review the quality of our webinars. This is the 19th webinars in this series. We started back in October and we are going for a little break of the Eastern. And after the Easter break, we will relaunch the webinar series with a slightly different focus to build, bet, to build back better. How can we retain what we have learned actually during the COVID-19 pandemic? How can we strengthen the resilience of health systems? How can we avoid falling into traps of austerity, of cutting back services, of not compensating for what was lost during the crisis. So that's from my side for the moment. And uh, now I will ask my colleague Erica to launch the poll on the topic of today before we hear the keynote. Hello there, thank you very much. Okay, so um, Annalisa, if you could uh, launch the poll. That'd be great. Fantastic. So this is just to get a little bit of an idea where um, you all are and uh, how you feel about um, the topic today. So the first uh, question is, is the infodemic impacting pandemic response effectiveness in your country? And that's a straightforward yes, no question. And then the second question is, who should be playing a role in addressing infodemics? 
So is it that healthcare workers? Is it a job for specialist fact checkers? Is it a job for the media organisations, educational institutions, civil society organisations, communities, me, as in all of us, or all of the above? So let us know what you think um, with the poll. And um, yes, and uh, we'll, I'll give you the results after... Christine has uh, given her keynote. Thank you very much. So without further ado, Ashley, the floor is all yours. Thanks very much. Well, good morning, good afternoon and, and good evening to everyone. I'm delighted to be here to uh, get a discussion going about how we can all move the emerging discipline of infodemic management forward to ensure better access to credible health information and better health for all. Now, just over a year ago, the WHO Director General raised the alarm about the twin challenges of fighting an infodemic whilst also fighting an epidemic. And what do I mean by an infodemic? So we're all on the same page here. Well, an infodemic is about much more than misinformation. It's also about an overwhelming amount of information and information gaps and confusing messaging that altogether are making it really difficult for everyone to know what to do. Now, this confusion can lead people to ignore public health measures, and take risks that can cause serious harm. And I expect we've all heard the tragic reports this past year of people being poisoned by drinking methanol or improperly using cleaning products. And there has been polarization about basic safety measures such as mask wearing. So we need, we really need infodemic management here as a, as a priority, I would say, to help save lives during health emergencies to build and maintain trust in health authorities and health measures, to reduce our susceptibility to misinformation because we're all vulnerable to it, and to ensure universal access to credible health information so that everyone can make more informed decisions about how to protect themselves and each other. So how did we get into this infodemic situation? Well, the communication ecosystem that we're in today uh, clearly looks a lot different than it did 100 years ago during a flu pandemic. Advances in digital media are making it easier than ever before to rapidly share unverified content. But we can't simply point fingers at digital platforms because they're also providing new ways to share good information and expert advice to help people. Though, of course, I think we're all on the same page here about understanding that there's still a lot of work to be done in that space to improve transparency and protect people from harms. But this problem of rumors and conspiracy theories, it's not unique to the digital space. So we know that there's a long history of people sharing harmful narratives that are counterproductive to public health measures. Uh, one example I can think of is that uh, there was a cholera outbreak in France in the 1830s, and there was no internet back then, uh, but there was still a conspiracy theory that was circulating offline about the illness being a hoax uh, caused by doctors who were trying to poison the working class. So we understand that there's a need to better manage our entire communication ecosystem, both online and offline, to ensure universal access to credible health information as a basic human right. Now, how are we going to do this? Well, I'll touch on a few of our approaches today. Lots of work to do in this space. So first, we really need to build out this discipline of infodemic management. So WHO has developed a framework with 50 global actions to help concentrate activities and a public health research agenda for managing infodemics to accelerate investment in the science and innovation for an evidence-based approach. And I'll also call out here, it would be good to watch out for the special journal issues on infodemic management we've got coming out this year. We're also building new partnerships and a toolbox for countries to use. And as a part of this work, we really need to train a whole new generation of infodemic managers who can then effectively use and deploy these tools. In terms of advancing the science, now here we've realized there's a need for an evidence-based framework to manage infodemics as a key driver of epidemics, similar to a framework that epidemiologists use. 
And so we need to integrate infodemic management into our health security preparedness and response plans so that we can more rapidly flatten the infodemic curve, which you see here, to help flatten that epidemic curve. What does this mean? This means that we need to invest more in advancing our monitoring capabilities to better understand the spread and impact of an infodemic. And this is going to help us more effectively tailor our responses to it. We also need to strengthen the ongoing evaluations of interventions so that we have strong feedback loops in place for a more adaptive response that is able to track changing concerns of communities. So I encourage everyone to look in more detail at the research agenda and have a think about how you can contribute to this because there are lots of questions we still have to answer together, such as you know, how, are, how are infodemics and online influences affecting offline behavior and which interventions specifically are going to be more effective to manage the infodemic. Putting this framework into practice now uh, for the COVID-19 situation we're facing, we have four immediate priorities. So first, listening to community concerns from a place of empathy and understanding. The second priority here is sharing evidence and communicating about risks and benefits in a way that's timely and easy to understand and, and easy for people to translate into action. Third, protecting freedom of speech and promoting resilience to harmful messages, and four, empowering people and communities to take positive action. Now this is where partnerships are blooming. Uh, so WHO has partnered with IFRC and UNICEF and GORN to launch the Risk Communication and Community Engagement Collective Service in June last year to help drive a more coordinated response that puts communities at the heart of our work. And for building out the country toolbox, there is a lot of work underway here and I'll share one example with you today and happy to catch up about more. You're welcome to email. Um, WHO is innovating new digital approaches for listening to the concerns that people are sharing publicly. Now this includes a pilot we've launched starting in 20 countries to listen to emerging narratives, questions, concerns, using a social listening public health taxonomy we developed for COVID-19 so that this can better inform and better focus the community engagement uh, response. So for us, for partners, uh, for countries. Now this project is called EARS uh, because it stands for Early AI Supported Response with Social Listening. And it's currently running in four languages. And we're currently in the process of adding more countries and languages starting with Arabic. And you can see the link here. You can actually go to the public dashboard right now and have a look and, and play around with it. Uh, there's also a user authorized backend with additional features where teams can go do a deep dive to horizon scan and identify emerging issues for a near real time response. Now, data from offline studies that countries are undertaking, for example, knowledge, attitudes, and practice surveys, this kind of data, the structured data can also be uploaded for triangulation purposes. Uh, and we're also collaborating with UN Global Pulse to develop a radio speech to text translation tool so that we can better understand narratives in more remote communities that are relying more on radio than online platforms. Given the necessary resource, I think that this could be scaled up to many more countries, uh, to all of the WHO member states. And I'll say that it's already providing some indicators for a global perspective on emerging topics of interest where changes in communication approach may be needed. We are currently in the R&D and piloting phase and welcome collaboration. We've been developing sample analyses as part of our regular weekly digital intelligence reports with recommendations for action. And I can give you an example of the kind of intelligence that we're able to pull out. Uh, so as an example, a few weeks ago, we picked up on a rumor about forced vaccinations in schools in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And we were able to quickly alert our UNICEF colleagues to develop messaging for educators to help in outreach to parents to address that rumor. 
it was uh, it was a really interesting case study where there was a lot of panic and, and parents were pulling children out of school. So we can see the value in going beyond the kind of offline uh, survey work, which can take quite a bit of time for those results to come in. And at that point, you know, concerns, issues, questions may have marched on. So having a tool that gives us more close to real time uh, insight into issues that are emerging is incredibly valuable. And I should say too, that this is also helping to guide actions taken at WHO headquarters. And if you're not already, it would be good to follow the EpiWin webinars on YouTube, where you will see there are uh, topics that are tracking emerging issues that we're picking up through our intelligence work. Now, one more example and a few points for me to wrap up. Uh, as part of the push to develop our social intelligence globally to help guide the emergency response, I have to mention the extraordinary work that is happening, uh, that we're supporting through the Africa Infidemic Response Alliance, known as IRA. This includes 14 organizations such as WHO, UNICEF, Gavi, Africa CDC, and more, all working together to coordinate research and advocacy to support countries in managing the infodemic. Now, one of the exciting initiatives of IRA here that I'll mention, and it would be good for you to look out for online, is Viral Facts Africa, connecting health experts, fact checkers, and communicators to inoculate people against harmful misinformation. Essentially, they're all working together to make good information go viral. And I think one thing that uh, they'll tell you if you speak to anyone from the IRA group is that one thing we need more of to support this kind of great work is more trained infodemic managers. So going to my next slide here, on the professionalization side of things, we've already trained nearly 300 infodemic managers from nearly 80 countries. And I should say WHO, we can't do it alone. This needs to be a whole of society approach. And there could be infodemic management curriculum included in universities worldwide to aid in this effort. And I'm delighted to share that our Call for Applicants is live now for our second global infodemic manager training. So be sure to share this with your networks and encourage everyone to apply before the 9th May deadline. And this program is developing WHO certified infodemic managers who can be rapidly deployed to help with the infodemic response in countries around the world. In closing, my final call for action is a request for everyone to please read and sign our call for action to be an infodemic manager in your daily life. We have 500 signatories and counting so far from diverse organizations. And I think this is an opportunity for everyone to join the movement as a champion for truth and global health. Thank you. Christine, thank you so much for this great overview. I think that was very interesting and it clearly demonstrated there's need for a global response and a global organization that is providing policies, guidelines, tools and uh, monitoring on all these issues. It was also very interesting to see that technology, the artificial intelligence bit, you know, is really helping here, you know, it's kind of fighting back uh, the misuse of um, current uh, technologies. And I think also that um, the technology you just um, pre pre presented is probably also very useful for pandemics to come or other health issues actually. But the other thing I wanted to say is also, I quite liked your a slide with the little curve showing that it's not just reactive. You need to be proactive, if not preventive actually. So managing infodemic goes from the very beginning to the, to the very last. So thank you so much, Christine. And um, now, um, Erika and Annalisa, please, can you present us the results of the poll? Yes, Annalisa, if you could share the results, that'd be fantastic. So yes, unsurprising, given that you're here in the room, there is uh, a very strong uh, agreement that the infodemic is in fact uh, impacting on pandemic response effectiveness in your in your respective countries. Um, and there's a relatively even spread uh, between who's, who should be playing a role in this, but around half of you um, feel that it's it's all of the above. So it's pretty much everyone's responsibility 
to be having a role in addressing the infodemic. So, but not so many of you think it's uh, me. Hopefully that's not me as an individual, but me meaning all of you. But uh, yes, that's interesting as well. So um, it's everybody's job, but not mine, maybe as the, out the outcome from that particular question. So thank you very much. Back well, to actually, Erica, we had lately the builders in the house, and of course they were wearing masks, but they were arguing that they are really not useful and not protective. So I had to argue a little bit with the builders. Uh, but I think to some extent it's a role of, of each of us. I just mentioned actually that uh, one of the points I learned from um, Christine's presentation was that we not only need to be reactive, but also proactive and preventative. And that is a great bridge for the um, uh, spotlight intervention coming now from Ashley. Ashley, please, the floor is all yours. Erica, will you start Ashley's presentation, please? Thank you, everyone. And thank you much, um, Erica, for uh, hosting my slides today. Um, as uh, Matthias says, my name is um, Ashley Winter. I'm the Head of Strategic Communications in the UK Prime Minister's Office. Um, and my specialism is um, in using strategic communications to combat um, harmful myths and disinformation online. Since the beginning of the pandemic, my attention has been focused squarely on, on uh, COVID-19 as a problem. Um, so if we can go on to the next slide, please, Erica. Um, much of what Christine has said in her uh, spot uh, in her first presentation, uh, the UK very much agrees with. Um, we recognise that the use of technology to communicate um, as government communicators um, out to the public with essential health messaging um, has been completely, you know, transformed in this pandemic compared to um, what's gone before. However, we also have been very cognizant of the fact that. Um, the technology that we're relying on to communicate to the public is also being used to spread um, information that significantly undermines government responses and threatens future pandemic preparedness by ingraining what can be very damaging, harmful behaviours um, um, and attitudes towards um, uh, you know, trusted health institutions and health practices. Um, one of those practices being vaccinations. Um, the largest study today of global vaccine confidence, um, it surveyed 149 countries, found that confidence in vaccinations is dropping and it remains persistently low um, in Europe. Um, and the, the, I think the quote that I've popped into the slide um, from The Lancet really highlights that. Um, essentially, in other words, um, misinformation or um, the lack of quality information or people feeling overwhelmed by information, uh, all, the, all the different definitions of the infodemic um, could prevent people um, taking up the vaccines that could end this pandemic and all the loss of life and welfare that, that would come with that ending. So we see it as a very, very important issue and we put lots of resource um, uh, into it um, uh, and understanding um, uh, misinformation um, and um, what we've seen uh, is that anti-vaccination digital communications are very sophisticated and extensive. Um, we've seen some studies that have even predicted that uh, under current conditions um, anti-vaccination support would reach dominance in the next 10 years which is just um, a horrifying thought. Um, the public's willingness to accept um, a vaccine um, is, is you know, really fluctuating with the amount of misinformation we've seen um, and recent evidence from the um, London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine uh, has found that in the UK, um, people who said they would definitely um, accept a vaccine after being shown um, anti-vaccine misinformation dropped from 54% to 47%. Um, with the level of a vaccination um, needed to reach herd immunity sitting around 55% um, in uh, some of the studies that, that we go off as a team, um, that is a really concerning figure. That drop of six percentage points could be the difference between uh, the vaccine making a difference or not. So we knew um, uh, we've got a very good idea of the problem, um, but I'm not just here to talk to you about problems. Um, we have, uh, over the past year, been formulating strategic communications responses um, to the issue of misinformation. So, Erica, if I could have the next slide. Um, it's really interesting um, that the poll flagged up that uh, all of the above but not me uh, was the consensus. Um, 
that is really uh, in line with a lot of the research we've done as the UK. I think um, if any of you have ever read into media literacy, it's a skill that innately um, a lot of adults have. Um, but in times of anxiety and stress, people's ability to filter out fact from fiction takes a noticeable knock. Um, and our belief as the UK is that uh, strategic communications, as well as a number of other interventions um, that uh, you know, sort of were uh, hinted to in Christine's presentation, uh, need to be um, part of uh, the government response to help uh, stem infodemics. Um, and uh, as you can see by my slide, we've developed uh, this framework for helping reach out to people um, and place interventions along individuals' journey with health and COVID-19 information so that they are uh, their resilience to uh, harmful misinformation is built up. We want people at the end of uh, this uh, frameworks using to feel confident that the they can assess the accuracy of information that they know where to get um factual trusted information from um, and that they um embody the the behaviors that come from uh, what we call in the uk um information hygiene uh, so that they pause and they check when something uh, doesn't feel right um we do this, as I say, through uh, interventions placed at different stages of the information journey. So we have preventative interventions. They're designed to build resilience uh, before people come into contact with information. So they prevent people from falling prey to information. Um, it's all based off some really interesting academic studies, but I'm going to go into that on my next slide, so I won't cover it now. We couple the preventative, so the building resilience, with the providing factual information, the proactive um, uh, suite of assets that we've we've developed as well, and that's in combination with the the, the World Health Organization. And then on top of that, we also believe it's very important to deliver interventions that upskill people to limit the damage of misinformation once um, it's already spreading through their networks. Um, so an example of this. Um, is a series of digital interventions we've delivered, again, with the World Health Organization to inform people about the reporting process once they've seen misinformation so that uh, social media platform providers can get it taken down um, and therefore stop it from spreading further. But I'd like to take a little bit more time now, if we can have the next slide, Erica, to look at um, preventative methods and um, what um, is my favourite uh, go viral, which is an inoculation game. Inoculation theory um, uh, mixes up when we're speaking about vaccines, uh, vaccine metaphors. But the essential premise is that if you tell an individual, uh, introduce them to a, a small dose of misinformation, tell them the, the, the techniques and the tactics that they are being targeted with online, then they um, that builds up their resilience to those. And when they come across it in their everyday lives, um, they um, will not fall prey to um, the hyper emotional language, um, the peddling of fake experts or conspiracy theories, which we see as the, the three most prevalent misinformation tactics linked to COVID-19. Um, Go viral is based on um, uh, inoculation games that have gone before it, and um, those have been found to build up a player's immunity to um, misinformation, uh, they, it increases by 21% after just one play and that immunity can last for up to three months. We found it to be a really essential intervention um, that has been really shifting um, people's um, attitudes to health misinformation and helping them seek out much more trusted sources. It's now been translated into a number of different languages, English, German, Italian, and Spanish are currently live. Uh, we have Polish um, in the, uh, um, the pipeline. And um, as the UK, we're willing to work with other governments to help um, with the translation of this uh, really vital asset so that it can be something that not we alone are benefiting from. I think I'm over time, um, uh, apologies, but um, uh, I'm willing to, to stop now and, and, and pass the baton. 
Ashley, thank you so much for this very exciting insight into the situation in the UK and how you react to it with a kind of um, uh, quite multifaceted approach, but also then uh, zooming into this uh, particular app, it's very interesting to see and also to see that, you know, you're using again the technology to counter um, other other efforts to, to use the Uh, technology for for misinformation. It's also interesting to see that you apparently make a lot of reference to WHO and uh, work together, and that you share that you share your um, your successes with uh, your your app with with other countries. So thank you very much for this very very concrete uh, example. And I would now like to um, ask the second spotlight speaker um, coming from uh, Finland to uh, take the floor and uh, present us. Her, Anna, Annalena, your, your, your work actually on um, risk perception and how to improve, you know, reactions to it based on real-time data you are producing. Please, Annalena, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Okay. So thank you very much for, for uh, inviting me here to share something, what we have been doing here in Finland since February 2020 which is a risk uh, perception uh, monitoring um, uh, process, I would say, or project that we have been um, running uh, monthly and bi-weekly uh, uh, basis. So we wanted to do a practical framework a monitoring system really to analyze COVID-19 risk perceptions and pandemic risk perceptions of the public in real time in order to be able to feed in this information directly to the risk communication response. Um, we were using as a data sources, um, social media posts and also emails from the public to our organization. Um, and we did not use a keyword uh, kind of search, but actually a real qualitative data analysis process, although a rapid analysis to get real insights and understanding behind the, the words and the concepts of, of these risk perceptions. And within this, with this um, uh, analysis, we then were able to uh, draft risk communication messages, uh, basically bi-weekly. And the idea was, or has been to uh, assist risk communication response, for example, in trust building, and also in creation of messages Uh, content development for the campaigns that have been ongoing, and also in the prevention of misinformation and disinformation. And once these risk communication recommendations are drafted, then we have been reflecting and discussing them through knowledge co-creation with the different public health experts in the organization to kind of uh, refine and, and, and come up with the final set of, of recommendations which then are disseminated through the uh, uh, through um, uh, through different uh, uh, measures uh, or channels to everyone in the organization who are communicating with the public. Um, if we think about uh, Christine's presentation earlier on where she was talking about the WHO framework for the public health research agenda, so I believe our um, project actually is feeding into the stream, which is detecting and understanding the spread and impact of infodemic. I'll give you a few practical examples how we are basically bi-weekly using, uh, using the process and what are kind of the outcomes of, of the analysis. Here we can see um, in this slide that we have um, public perceptions are basically showing that there is a lack of understanding how to apply risk communication messages in everyday life. So the public is aware that you have to wash your hands and you should be keeping the distance, but they seem to be struggling how to actually implement this in everyday life. And our recommendation then is to uh, provide um, practical guidance for everyday life. And we decide to run this um, through an application of personal risk assessment And we decide to disseminate this idea through a social media influencers, whom we, um, who's, uh, whom we provide a capacity building training on the methodology, and we ask them to further disseminate these messages further. 
Another example, another analysis shows here that the public has very well internalized the importance of the behavior of each individual, which is great because in Finland, we actually have been having several uh, campaigns where we are stressing that everybody's behavior matters. Um, so it shows here that it's well internalized, but at the same time, the findings show that people don't actually believe that it is happening. They think that they are the only ones who, who are actually taking the distance. They are not meeting their friends or, or they are using the mask. So our recommendation in the end comes that uh, we need to uh, make these behaviors protective uh, measures as a social norm. And our application is a promotion of positive examples. And we decide to basically insert or include these positive examples in all kinds of communication coming from different, different uh, channels during this time. The third example here that I have is again, where the data shows that there is a disbelief regarding the effectiveness of corona prevention measures. So basically the posts are showing that oh, people are requesting, you know, where is the scientific evidence for, for using the mask and what does it matter if I wear the mask or not? Um, the recommendation that we come up with this is then that we decide to concretize the transmission chains of the coronavirus to really show how it goes and how these barriers actually do make barriers. Um, uh, for the uh, virus transmission. So we create a real story of the uh, virus transmission, which is actually a video clip, which again is disseminated through uh, the social media, uh, di through different social media platforms. So those are shortly some of, the, those, some of these um, practical examples, how, how we are using, uh, using this uh, framework and how, how, I mean, this is an ongoing process. So as I'm saying, it's, it's still going on and it, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's running and, and this is the, the, uh, um, the essence of the system. Yeah, thank you. Annalena, thank you so much. I found this very interesting. And actually, even though you're using different methodology, it echoes some of the uh, things uh, Christina, Christine said um, earlier, because first of all, you are listening. You're listening to concerns. Uh, you're trying to understand what are actually the misperception. And then the second thing is you're not just only uh, doing it in, in, in real time, but you're also connecting it to, to action. So it's not just a scientific activity, but it's really an intervention and you're doing continuously and uh, that sounds very, very interesting and uh, interesting. And, and I think we would like to hear an evaluation of this, you know, to what extent uh, you have really changed and addressed uh, misperceptions and uh, worked to contain the, the infodemic. But it's uh, very interesting and um, encouraging. Thank you so much, so much, Annalisa. And finally, we come to our third keynote speaker. Neville from Malta. Mal Neville is working for the government and the theme of Neville's presentation will be, you know, how can you make, how can you actually confront the infodemic if you have not plenty of, of means, if you need to um, uh, rely on a handful of people and uh, not much money. Neville, please. Thanks, Matthias. Um, I'll share, I've just got a slide which I'd like to share. So as, as you pointed out, I'd like to address those in the audience who have clicked on the me option, or at least all of the above, or maybe anyone who is a convert uh, towards the me option. So um, effectively, uh, I hope everyone is, is familiar with Malta. I understand recently we've been hitting some headlines because of the vaccination drive here, which is surely positive. Um, uh, uh, basically, it's a, it's a very small country of a half a million people. Um, as you can understand, our institutions are not possibly as developed and as resourced um, as those in larger countries. But nonetheless, we have understood the importance of infodemic management from pretty much day one in the pandemic. Um, effectively, the way we do infodemic management is there's quite a few of us, uh, especially in public health, who are doing this um, on their own steam. But we also liaise a lot between us. Um, so it's a bit of an informal network, but we do keep that network very much alive. And part of that network, we also have 
the institutions within the uh, the Ministry of Health. Um, we've got one directorate, particularly the which is called the Disease Prevention and Health Promotion Directorate, that listens to us a lot in terms of uh, how to shape the messages that it communicates on its official channels as well. So we try to integrate as much as we can. Uh, basically, um, what I'd like to share with you here is, is some principles that we feel have been working very well for us. Um, as I said, we do not have an infodemic management unit. We're basically using our existing systems, plus a bit of goodwill from a number of people who are uh, using some of their spare time to engage with the population out there. So the first very important principle is to be where people are talking. Okay, so uh, again, we have a lot of health promotion uh, departments who set up material on their websites, uh, which is good, which is fine. But frankly, people are not on their browsers so much. They're actually more on their social media. So if we really want to know what they're saying, we need to be where they are commenting, where they are actually um, uh, you know, expressing themselves. And in fact, here in Malta, actually, we have a few, we have chosen actually amongst us uh, who do a bit of infodemic management, um, some largish groups on social media. Facebook is the most prevalent social medium here. Um, and to, to do you know, so our own social media listening. I must admit that since EARS have come, has come on board, I was super happy and I definitely have, have shared this with my colleagues and we tend to refer to it to follow um, what's, uh, what's happening there. Um, uh, yes, also news outlets, you know, the ones with comments underneath, they attract a lot of conversations locally. I'm not sure about your specific countries. Another important principle uh, we try to employ is, um, you know, misinformers tend to engage in a lot of emotional language. I've seen some excellent research coming out of uh, Zurich University, I understand, um, looking at the sort of the level of emotional uh, uh, messaging that happens within misinformation. And uh, there is a tendency that when you burst that bubble, when you try to contradict that uh, information that is being uh, shared, uh, people get aggressive and start attacking you personally. The, the secret there is not basically to insult anyone. Nobody has ever been convinced by aggression, but rather by reaching out. And it's very important to keep calm. Uh, I find it also very um, productive to be amongst the first to engage in an opportunity. What do I mean here? So, you know, following the news outlets, you see an article, um, case in point, uh, we have a local doctor here who is, let's say, more inclined towards the misinformation uh, side than the scientific side, so to say. And he published an article in one of the leading English language newspapers. So I tried to be there amongst the first in the comments and sharing graphs and evidence underneath the article. And I think it actually has helped to limit greatly the circulation of that article in the first place. Um, and who did, you know, and, and again, never underestimate the value of putting stuff in comments. I've personally, what I've learned is that if I share something from my profile or from my department's profile, it gets shared so much. But if you actually comment on something which is going viral, uh, typically a misinformation item, and you actually share the right evidence there, it actually reaches even more people. So, you know, even misinformation can actually help you deliver their message more simply by kind of hitching your, your, your carriage, so to say, to that piece of information. Um, it's important to just answer the question, all right? So um, most, uh, it's not the, the first time I, I uh, just deliver the information and then obviously there's a stream of, of comments following that. Some of it will have a certain level of abuse. You know, sometimes it's better to actually just deliver the information and leave. Okay, 
that actually keeps your profile high amongst the people who are following you. And this is important for the last point I have to mention down here. Limit yourself to the evidence, avoid opinions, and be aware of something. Sometimes the evidence is not in your favor. Sometimes there's an evidence that might not be delivering, you know, the message you wish to, you wish to share. So it's important to be factual. All right. So there are these cons, there are these pros. We believe the pros exceed the cons. All right. We need to be um, as factual as possible. You need to focus. All right. Again, um, several misinformers try to pull several issues at the same time. And in the same post, they try to, you know, um, implanting chips and uh, <laughs> and poisoning you and uh, whatever. Um, you need to focus your messages. So try to deliver, address one key point in that misinformation. Uh, don't try to address everything and don't try to give ex extra information that people can latch on to uh, with more misinformation. Needless to say, in all this, you need to do a lot of horizon scanning. For us, horizon scanning means being wired in into international networks, following international news, trying to get hold of as much literature as possible, as quickly as possible. And here I need to thank colleagues from across Europe. Um, uh, I need to mention here particularly mm -hmm. the, the Yes. Your time is up. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you speed up a little bit? Sure. So, uh, yes. Um, so basically, yes, uh, clearly the networks are very important for you to keep uh, abreast of what's happening. Once you achieve all this, you actually don't inoculate yourself. You would have achieved inoculation because people start sharing the stuff you're sharing. And that means that you are achieving what you're trying to do. When you see that your information is being shared by fellow medics um, and other key people in the community, then that means that the messages are, are arriving. And there I've shared with you um, uh, something that the WHO has uh, cooked up for me um, during the first training um, that Chris mentioned earlier on. So ultimately, you don't need a lot of resources. You can just get down there and, uh, and do it. Neville, thank you so much for sharing your practical insights and your experience here on the infodemic management. And, uh, you know, the principles you were presenting, actually, um, they look to me like principles of good health promotion and public health. Uh, go to the settings, have the right language when you talk to the people, focus on the evidence, uh, seems to be all very sensible, and uh, but still very difficult to uh, maintain in uh, the situation in, in real life. I would now like to ask all the presenters um, to join with their videos. And Erica, would you please uh, tell us uh, what's coming through the chat box? I saw there's quite a number of uh, comments and questions in there. Please uh, feed back to the panel. And each of the panelists, please just take out one of the questions and answer it so that we have the chance for a second uh, round of uh, answers. Please, Erica. Yes, it's been a very busy chat box. Some really interesting things in there. Um, so one of the really uh, key questions I think that comes out of this is about the broader applications. So looking to the future, looking beyond epidemics, is there a chance we could be using these techniques more broadly? Um, I was thinking maybe inoculation against things like tobacco tactics. So is there are there broader applications for these things? Um, is there also an argument that we should be refocusing upstream? So who are the stakeholders in the infodemic with the misinformation, the disinformation? And could we be also be refocusing upstream instead of pulling people out of the river further down? Um, what can we do to uh, make at the personal and community level to make sure people feel less alone in implementing recommendations. I think that was a question more for uh, Annalina, but please do uh, feel free to jump in as well. Um, and then again, a question maybe more for Anna, but when we're translating resources, do we need to look at just the language or do we need to, to look at the local culture as well? So when we're translating into French, for example, would we need a different resource for French speaking Africa than, than we would use in France, for example? Um, and then a question for uh, maybe for Neville as the, our, um, uh, our solo um, sort of like uh, person. Um, 
what can we do to be reaching people in lockdown? Because it's not like we can be discussing things over a cup of coffee or a pint. Okay, so over to you. I'm happy to pick up the, the point on scaling. Um, I think uh, as a government communicator um, and to many practitioners on the line, um, you'll know that in times of, of crisis, as we've seen within the pandemic, you have to balance um, getting something um, perfect to getting something out. Um, that's certainly a choice. For example, I know a couple of people in the chat have raised um, uh, Go Viral and the different translations. Um, our ambition has always been to work with partners um, on their area of priorities um, for this resource that we've developed um, so that it can have as big a global reach as possible. Um, but it obviously is most effective when it's done um, uh, not just with language translation, but with cultural translation as well, go viral. Um, if any of you have seen it, played it, it's not a good game. It is a great comms intervention. It is a very simple chatbot. Um, and what pulls people to play is humour. Obviously, humour is very different in different regions. Um, so a very short answer to what I'm making into a long answer is yes, I think culture is very important when you're, you're translating assets. But what I would measure that with is when time is of the essence, sometimes doing something that can be understood um, and then uh, tweaking it in a second iteration is also an option worth exploring. Christine, you might want to come in. Sure, thank you. Um, so there are a couple of good questions uh, in there that I'd like to pick up. So uh, one, on the question about whether there's applicability for other health issues, absolutely. Uh, this toolbox that we're developing can be applied for global health more broadly. You know, for example, the social listening taxonomy and tools such as EARS can be used to better understand and, and identify much earlier myriad health threats. This can be applied to looking at Ebola outbreaks, influenza outbreaks. Uh, this can be used to better understand the issues surrounding uh, obesity, alcohol, tobacco, as you mentioned, Erica. So really we're focused on building a global toolbox for global health and, and very practical tools for countries to implement in their, their health programs. Uh, and one of the other questions that came up in the chat box here, which I think is a really important one when we're all thinking about how to be infodemic managers in our daily life. This was from Chris about how do we reach people with, uh, with this helpful messaging? How do we reach more people with the helpful messaging? And, uh, and it's a great question, Chris. So diffusing helpful messaging, absolutely it can start with our own networks. You know, one of the challenges of trying to amplify this good information online is that we tend to get stuck in our own little social bubble and echo chamber as Neville was saying. So one helpful thing that we can look at doing uh, and we're do working with collaborators on this right now is to try and map out what the social network looks like for a given topic such as COVID-19 vaccines, for example. And then identify which influence Influencers look like they're straddling different groups, different networks, and try and see if you can get them to amplify the helpful messaging, to diffuse it more widely, to get over those bottlenecks, to help the information travel further over. So very interesting because it uh, requires even more research into social networking, and uh, that would be really very interesting. Annalena. Thank you. Um, I was thinking of, of answering to this question regarding um, this um, how to make people to feel less alone with all these um, all these um, um, preventing measures, and I'm really a big believer in context specificity, and I believe that you know in each setting and each country, people should actually look into where these positive role models and and uh, positive uh, examples can come out. I mean, who are the influencers and who really matter to the people? So I wouldn't say that there is a one way now to go on and say, this is how we make everybody look at uh, positively these things, but really go into their own context and see which kind of positive messaging repeatedly could actually give a feeling for people that that other people are also, that we are all in the same boat and we're all actually doing doing the same thing. So I wouldn't say it. Um, just a quick mention also about the importance of the of the culture. I really agree with all the other speakers. Like it's the, the looking into the you know specific cultural settings is, is so important. Well, at the same time, there is an importance to generalize and scale up all these these interventions because a small scale interventions don't lead in the end of the way 
to big impact. So there is always this balance to find how much to look into the, uh, the culture, which definitely have to be included there, and at the same time go on and think how to, to scale up. So, I mean, this, thank I you think so this much. is a never ending balance. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Anna Lena. Neville. So, um, I'd like to just visit two particular points here. One is the cultural contextualization, it's key. Translation only actually barely scratches the surface of what is required to transfer information from one country or one culture to another. We sometimes, actually part of the misinformation in a way management that we have to do is to combat people locally trying to push for uh, reforms happening locally based on what has happened elsewhere. Certain interventions work elsewhere because there is a specific context. Um, uh, you know, for example, the evidence around lockdowns don't work. I don't want to go into that discussion. But then again, what is a lockdown? Some people did sort of pseudo lockdowns. Others did more rigorous lockdowns. So there's a lot of this. And also um, the advice might be different from one country to another because of specificities of that country. So we need to be careful there before just sharing something, say, from the UK into a multi-social media forum. The other point is about influencers. We need to define influencers here. They're not the people on Instagram, all right? So um, our experience actually is going for the traditional influencers, what the media calls influencers, was not actually terribly productive because these were people trying to make a living from there. So we found less, uh, how can I say, goodwill to help for uh, no money, basically, uh, from these kind of influencers. They wanted to be paid to actually share the message. On the other hand, locally, we know that medics and certain academics are actually very well respected. And that's how, personally, I try to amplify our messages. We have social media fora, we have groups, of doctors, for example, on Facebook, and I make sure to share certain information with them and make sure they are on board, because I know that people are calling them up for that final peace of mind. Thanks, thanks, Neville. I think uh, two things are uh, very important. Um, it is not that one size fits all. There are cultural differences between countries, but also within countries, actually. I think Ashley was uh, making reference to this and uh, that we need to very carefully uh, choose the people we are working with to spread the, the right information. Erica, do we have time for a quick round? Just... Uh... Okay, so very, very quickly. Um, uh, how can we evaluate the impact of what we're doing? Um, is it an easy thing to do? How are we assessing that? And very hard question about the intersection of pandemics, pandemics and political campaigning and information management. And is there anything particular around that we should be looking at? Um, and then also, is it easier to work with cynics or believers? So, Big questions yeah. for a quick round. Ashley, would you like to start? And Christine, you have the, the last word to say, so to say, to wrap up. Ashley, please. Yeah, I would really like to pick up on the, the cynics versus believers point. Um, we've uh, based all of our um, campaigning very firmly on, on, on audience insight and we've worked rigorously with academic partners to achieve that. I think what we've landed on is you, it's not what's easiest, but what's most impactful. Um, and, and where to reach uh, out there. And we call them the hesitant. So the people who are being targeted by um, uh, the, the more virulent cynics who are not believers, but have the potential to be, um, they are the most impactful for governments to be communicating with. Um, and it's, it's their movement one way or the other that could be the, the cincher between a good, for example, vaccine rollout or not. So that, that's who I would uh, argue for. So you are aiming at what is called in a general election, the undecided voters <laughs> that can yeah. still be kind of convinced. Anna-Lena. Um, I will um, just men uh, ask, I mean, have a few words about this, um, the importance of the impact and evaluating and monitoring of, of these efforts. So definitely when something new like what we have uh, launched has been seen established. So the ongoing monitoring is, is very important. And of course, again, when we are talking about the pandemic situ um, situation, um, 
I think we are not the only ones that are kind of lacking behind in this monitoring and evaluation aspect, because the first thing is to get the, the system running. But definitely as a second part, when things go on, there is very much importance, especially before expansion, to look into uh, what has worked and what, what hasn't worked before for, for expanding. But again, as I'm saying, unfortunately, in, in such a uh, emergency situation, these things usually uh, follow. Not that they are not important, but it's just the prioritizing at the moment of the emergency, how it goes. Thank you so much, Anna-Lena. Neville, very quickly before Christine wraps up. Sure, so uh, two quick sentences. One, infodemic management is a whole of society approach. It affects politics, it affects economics, it affects health, and all of these affect health in the long run. So that's my first point. The second point, successful infodemic management depends on listening, listening, listening. That's excellent. Key. Thank you so much, Neville. Christine. There was a point about uh, politics that got in there and, and not to get too deeply into that, but I, I want to say that disinformation campaigns, you know, in this space of information warfare, they are a threat that, you know, has the potential to undermine global health security and there is a need for concerted global action in that space. But malicious actors are really in the minority. If we're looking at the COVID-19 situation, you know, if we're looking at vaccines as an example, most drivers of, of misinformation are actually people who have genuine concerns and questions that need to be addressed. And they have good intentions about wanting to share the best information with folks in their network. So I think, you know, having the understanding to, to accept that it's good to ask questions about public health response measures, uh, and seek out reliable sources of, of credible information. That's it's a very positive thing. Uh, and another point I think we should flag up here is that there's a, a concern about just trying to chase misinformation and, and take it offline as an infringement on freedom of speech and also pragmatically for public health teams. It's very difficult to understand what those concerns are to be able to address them if those, those issues are being taken down uh, off of platforms. So really the focus here needs to be on universal access to health information as a human right that we all need to protect. And we need to listen to those concerns around us echoing Neville's point. So in closing, we welcome new collaborations. We encourage everyone to become an infodemic manager in your daily life. You know, check your sources, ask yourself what is motivating a particular post if it's evidence-based before you share it. Get involved in your community of fact checkers, become a champion for truth and help your public health authority by sharing their advice and your questions with them so they can see where Thanks. more attention is needed. Thank you. Christine. Thank you so much. And before we close the session today, just again, the reminder, as I said at the beginning, we will have a short break of the webinar series and then relaunch it with a slightly different focus about building back better. And it's really about how we pull out of the crisis as health systems and public health systems, strengthening the resilience based on what we have learned during the COVID-19 crisis, but also avoiding pitfalls and difficult situation when we are building back better. So thank you so much. We'll keep you informed and bye-bye.